World Bank Deputy Chief Economist Ayan Kose. This is becoming a tradition for us. I'm really glad to see you. Yes, thank you, thank you, Tony. So we heard the global outlook, not unexpected, tepid growth, but some positive signs, inflation coming down, U.S. leading that growth and offsetting some of the slower parts of the world, like the yeah. EU, for example. But there are a number of warning signs on the horizon, and I want to just walk through some of these risks with you. First, the Middle East. The war between Hamas and Israel has already cost tens of thousands of lives. The humanitarian disaster is enormous, but also billions of dollars of damage. However, the potential for it to become a truly global impact is there. How are you viewing that and how do you mitigate that risk? Obviously, the geopolitical tensions around the world uh, is the number one risk when we think about what could go wrong in the global economy. And uh, Middle East uh, is a significant part of that. Uh, escalation of the war will have an immediate impact on the price of oil. Uh, now, in the past, when these types of escalations took place in the Middle East, given that the, you know, that's the, in a sense, the oil reservoir of the world, uh, the consequences were quite significant. We know what happened in the 70s, early 90s, early 2000s. But this time, uh, there is a force that can compensate that. There is a significant amount of uh, ample oil out there, especially in OPEC plus countries. Uh, they have spare capacity they can bring uh, if there is a supply disruption. So we think that the price can spike uh, for a period of time, but then things will come down uh, when those producers with spare capacity provide the supply. But uh, of course, the, you know, the magnitude of escalation depends on how things will play out. But I think this oil price shock, if it happens, will be different than the previous ones in the sense that the impact will be smaller. As we speak, the BRICS summit is underway in Russia, led, of course, hosted by Vladimir Putin. First, what do you make of the timing? The, when you think about these types of events, uh, uh, it takes uh, quite a bit of time planning, putting things uh, together. I perfectly understand the premise of your question, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, these are major economies. They account for significant global output, significant global growth and they have certain objectives. So this isn't counter-programming on Putin's part or sending a message about a, an emerging multipolar world. I won't be able to comment on those. Uh, the only thing I can comment on, we would like to see more cooperation between countries. If they are competing, and there is nothing wrong with competition, that competition should be disciplined in the sense that while they are competing, they should not create these negative externalities to others. So what worries us, yes, there is fragmentation. There are reasons, security reasons. Uh, countries introduce trade barriers. Uh, what are the, you know, the collateral costs associated with these types of measures? Ultimately, we are looking at, you know, developing economies. Uh, what are the costs of these types of protectionist moves or alliances when it comes to global peace, global prosperity. We are extremely worried about, of course, the increase in the number of protectionist measures and consequences of that for global trade. He began the summit actually by calling for a de-dollarization around the world, right? The, the dollar no longer being the sort of preferred payment system. It doesn't seem like that's getting a ton of traction, but if it were to happen, what kind of impact would that have on the global economy? At the end of the day, Tony, it is not just the name of the currency, it is the credibility of the currency when we think about how countries would like to, you know, undertake these transactions through what uh, medium they would like to undertake. So the, uh, if it were to happen, uh, and my personal view, it will not happen in the near term. Uh, obviously, that will have geopolitical consequences. 
for us, the big question is the following. Will this facilitate trade? Will this facilitate investment? Will this facilitate cross-border commerce among countries? Those are the types of issues really we would like to focus on rather than uh, basic single-minded views of, oh, we don't want to use this currency, we would like to use that currency. Speaking of growth, the world's second biggest economy, China, is showing some signs of slowing. What kind of risk do you think that might present? If China slows in a gradual fashion, and that's our baseline scenario, uh, that's good for China. If China slows uh, uh, rapidly, uh, that uh, has huge consequences because it is uh, one of the you know, major consumers of goods produced by other countries, especially commodities. And of course, uh, that will have implications for those commodity exporting economies and uh, economies uh, selling goods to China. Think of, you know, European countries. Uh, some of them become very much reliant on Chinese markets. I think that uh, what we have seen over the past four weeks on the part of Chinese policymakers, uh, first they started with, you know, monetary policy support measures. They explain and announced that they will bring fiscal support measures. So if they can put together a comprehensive program to stimulate the economy, to overcome the lack of confidence, that will be a fantastic outcome for China because uh, there is a serious weakness when it comes to consumer confidence. There are serious problems when it comes to real estate sector. And it will be a huge positive for the global economy. We've talked before about criticism about China's lending policies toward countries that are developing and in need of those loans. There's been some criticism recently of their borrowing policies as well. U.S. Uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen saying recently that they should no longer, China should no longer be able to borrow from the World Bank, that they're out of the category, they're too big of an economy. How would you respond to that? Uh, we are a multilateral organization. Uh, we work with our members. U.S. is one of our members. China is another member. Uh, countries, when they approach the World Bank, hopefully they are not approaching us just because we are a financial institution. They're approaching us. There is lending, but with that lending, there is significant transfer of knowledge, policy advice, technical support. So. It is up to the membership to make these types of decisions, which countries continue to borrow, which countries, you know, stop borrowing. We will work with the membership and, you know, move forward. Before this week began, uh, World Bank President Ajay Banga did a press conference where he said, internally, no conversations are focused on the outcome of the U.S. presidential election. We've got many other things to worry about. Now, one of the things that's a top of mind, I know for you, is Ida. Uh, the International Development Association and replenishing funding for it. Yeah. Let me begin by asking, is this year presenting any particular challenge as the so-called poly crisis faces so many economies to get the necessary funds? And then I'll ask you a follow-up specifically about the United States. The poly crisis applies to developing economies, but it also applies to advanced economies. Uh, their uh, uh, fiscal buffers quite limited. They need to think how to allocate their resources. We are very mindful of that as an institution. At the same time, when we look around the world, we see a serious reversal in development. One in four developing countries is poorer today than they were in 2019. Rest of the world moved on from the pandemic. These economies, they are still trying to recover from the pandemic in terms of their per capita income levels. Is that because of debt? What is the reason for that? I'm just trying to understand how the, the pandemic had that kind of impact on 25% of the world. Because uh, you had a huge collapse in global output, global trade, and uh, it did not end there. There were multiple shocks, the inflation shock, the interest rate shock, the shock associated with what's going on in Europe, what's going on in Middle East. And uh, we have a huge food insecurity problem. And countries were, you know, 
uh, they came to this uh, pandemic episode with already sizable amount of debt. So what did they do? They now allocating a significant share of their uh, revenues, around 20%, just to pay back the, the interest. They are unable to allocate the type of funding that is necessary for education, for health, for infrastructure. And those are the types of things that will translate these economies into, you know, somewhat uh, more prosperous societies. So is there a plan B if, for example, the United States or other big economies dial back their contributions? Uh, I think, Tony, this is the 80th anniversary of, you know, Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, obviously, there is a plan B, C, D and E. We have been around with the uh, wars. We have been around with uh, bigger problems. We saw the pandemic, global financial crisis, uh, the countries graduating from IDA, countries uh, got stuck in IDA. Uh, the, we need to find ways to basically land, land intelligently, provide the policy advice. Uh, we have been going through a process of evolution uh, trying to use our balance sheet more effectively, trying to use uh, other financial instruments, the risking instruments more effectively. We have made significant progress as an institution. And uh, we are not saying these countries shouldn't do anything and the global community should support them. They needed to do many things. But the global community uh, at this point should provide the necessary funding to overcome this huge challenge. When, you know, we think about, uh, there's this, uh, you know, Eisenhower story. Uh, what is important and what is urgent? Urgent is not important, important is not urgent. This is a period, we have a very important problem and it is urgent. Why? Because these are the countries, they are still young. Advanced economies are aging. Most emerging market developing economies, they are going to start aging in five years. These are the countries they will bring young people to the global labor force. We need to make sure those people are educated, they have access to healthcare, they have the necessary infrastructure, they are equipped with the technology, they can compete in global labor markets. That's good for advanced economies. So it is not just an important challenge, it's an urgent challenge given the reversal we see. Ayan Kosei, thank you so much. Thank you. Tom.